In the introductory video, I talked about the idea of understanding the behavior of a DE without actually solving it. I also talked about the scarcity of solutions. How many DEs are unsolvable, at least without having to invent entirely new functions? This means that it will be very useful if I can analyze a DE without having an explicit solution. Because solving is very difficult and often can only be done at best approximately. Methods that analyze DEs without solving are called qualitative methods for DEs. They don't give a precise solution, but they give a description of the behavior of the solution. And for many applied mathematics situations, this description might be sufficient. They allow for interpretation without actually having solutions, and interpretation is often what we need. So I want to start the course with these qualitative methods, and for a couple of reasons. First, I think they help to build the important concepts of the course. But second, we can use these in the future to check our solutions when we do actually find solutions. If we know what kind of general behavior a solution must have, we can check whether the behavior in the solution we calculate is actually correct, whether or not mistakes have been made. The first qualitative method is something that I teach in Calculus 1, so it will be a review to students who have studied with me before, and it may be new to others. This is a method of describing the behavior of an autonomous first-order DE, and it is called phase line analysis. If I have an autonomous DE, which I write with the derivative on the left and the other terms, which only involve the dependent variable on the right, since this is a very common setup for population dynamics, I'll use P and T representing population and time as the symbols here. So, f of p is some expression in p, but remember here that I'm trying to find the function p of t and its behavior. f of p is just some given expression. I'm looking for the function p of t. p is the dependent variable in the situation. So first, I look for values of p where f of p is 0. Such a value p0 is called a steady state of the system. And if f of p equals 0, that means that the left side, the derivative, is also zero. Well, that means that there is no change. These are the values of the population where no growth or decay ha happens, where the population is constant, steady. Away from the steady states, the right side is either positive or negative, which means that the left side is likewise either positive or negative. And when f of p is positive, that means the derivative is positive, so there is growth. And when f of p is negative, then the derivative is negative, so there is decay. This growth or decay between steady states is called the trajectory of the system. This gives me an approach to study an autonomous system. I calculate the steady states. At a steady state, nothing happens. Then I look at the trajectories, the behavior between the steady states. A positive trajectory is growth, either up to the next steady state or unbounded to infinity. And a negative trajectory is decay, either down to the next steady state or bounded down to negative infinity. A phase line is just a picture that captures all of this information. It lets me know how the population will behave without ever having to solve the differential equation. Let me do some examples. Here is an autonomous DE. The zeros of the right side are at p equals 0 and p equals 1. So those are the steady states. I draw them on this horizontal number line. I'm excluding the negative here since I'm assuming this is a population. Other models may include the negative half of the number line, of course depending on whether it is appropriate. Then I look at the trajectories. If I test between 0 and 1, say at p equals 1 half, then I get 1 quarter minus 1 half, which is negative 1 quarter, which is negative. The trajectory is downward, which I draw with a downward arrow. Likewise, if I test at p equals 2, I get 4 minus 2 equals 2, which is positive, so I get an upward arrow between 1 and infinity. This picture now lets me understand the behavior of this population. At 1 in whatever units we're using, it is fixed, steady. Below 1 in, again, whatever units we're using, it decays. And above 1 in these units, it grows without bound. Please note that the points on the phase line are all starting values of the population. This is a number line for p, not for the time t. And time is not shown on the phase line. The phase line just tells us what will happen for certain starting values of the population. Here's another example with 0, 2, and 5 as steady states. If I test at p equals 1, the cubic is positive. If I test at p equals 3, the cubic is negative. And if I test at p equals 6, the cubic is positive again. I draw the trajectory arrows to match. 
And again, the picture gives me an interpretation of the system. Starting below two in whatever units we're using, the population grows up to the steady state of two. Starting between two and five, the population decays back down to the steady state of two. And starting above five, the population grows without bound. Here's one more example with steady states of zero and four. Testing at p equals do two gives a positive trajectory, and testing at p equals five gives a negative trajectory. Between zero and four, the population grows towards the steady state, and starting above four, the population decays back down to the steady state. The example I just gave, where the population always tends to a certain steady state, grows up to it from below and down to it from above, is an example of logistic growth. The differential equation for logistic growth is always the same form a constant times p times another constant minus p. After exponential growth, logistic growth is the most basic and most important model for differential equations. And it's very good to have a strong concept of these two models and their solutions. The percentage growth equation with its exponential solution and the logistic growth equation with its logistic growth solution. Exponential growth is the most fundamental kind of growth curve, but it is unbounded. Logistic growth is the most fundamental kind of bounded growth, where the growth will level off at a certain point. Phase lines are great for autonomous equation, but what about non-autonomous first-order DEs? Well, there is another technique for these, a technique involving two constructions, direction fields and integral curves. I'll spend the rest of this video describing the second technique. Say I have a first order equation where the derivative, which I'll now write dy over dx, is isolated on the left, and everything else is on the right. And I'll use f of xy as a notation for the expression on the right. Let me interpret this. dy over dx is derivative, which is a slope, and that's the slope of some graph. xy is a point on the plane. f of xy, therefore, will give a value for every point on the plane, and by the equality here, that value is a slope. Therefore, this DE is essentially assigning a slope to every point in the Cartesian plane. Doing so is called a slope field, and I'll use this slope field to help understand the differential equation. Let me move straight into examples, so this hopefully becomes a little bit more clear. Here's an equation dy over dx equals y. This says that at every point in the plane, the slope is equal to the y-coordinate. I can draw a bunch of arrows to express this. When y equals zeros, the arrows <coughs> when y equals zeros, the arrows are flat. At y equals one, the arrow shows a slope of one. At y equals two, the arrow shows a steeper slope at two. At y equals negative one, the arrow shows a downward slope of negative one, and so on for all y values. The x coordinate doesn't show up on the right at all, so the slope doesn't depend on the x coordinate, and you can see if I move in the x direction, I get the same slopes all the way across. In this way, I produce a slope for every point on the plane. What do these slopes mean? Well, they are the slopes of y of x, and y of x is the solution to the differential equation. Therefore, they are the slopes of the graphs of solutions. Well, I can try and draw a curve that matches these slopes. Here are some of those curves. At every point on this curve, its slope matches the arrow. These curves are the graphs of the solutions, and there's a whole family of them, as I would expect. And what I have drawn here are just exponential graphs. Well, that's unsurprising, because since this is a percentage growth equation, so it must have exponential solutions. The direction field made the general shape of those solutions known without having to ever actually integrate anything to find them. Here's another direction field. This is only defined for positive y because of the square root. The slope is given by the x-coordinate times the root of the y-coordinate. And feel free to check at any of these points. At 2, 4, I get a slope of 4. At negative 1, 1, I get a slope of negative 1, so forth, and so on. Just by putting the coordinates into this x root y expression, I get a slope at each coordinate. Well, then I draw the integral curves, the graphs which match these slopes. These slopes start downwards, level off, and then grow again. So even though I have no idea exactly what these functions are, I do know their general shape. These have a kind of parabolic behavior, going down, leveling, and then growing. And this tells me quite a bit about the behavior without ever actually knowing anything about how to solve this differential equation. Here's another example. 
This one has a slope everywhere except on the y-axis where x equals zero, since that would lead to division by zero. Well, then x and y are both positive um, in the first quadrant, which means the slope is positive, and then in the third quadrant, they're both negative, which also means the slope is positive. In those quadrants, I get growth, and in the second and fourth quadrant, when one is positive and the other is negative, I get decay. Also, the slopes are steeper the farther I are the farther I get away from the origin. And then here are the integral curves. These are also somewhat parabolic, decaying and then growing again, or doing the opposite below the x-axis. Although I must be careful, none of these functions are actually defined at x equals zero, so these are all discontinuous across the y-axis. But again, I still get a pretty decent idea of how the functions must behave. Here's another for dy over dx equals x times y. Again, this is pretty similar with positive and negative slopes divided by quadrants and slopes steeper the further they are away from the origin. And I get to get solutions that look a bit like parabolas, although the shapes are again a little bit different than the previous one. These are defined everywhere, no discontinuities here. And again, I've got a pretty good picture of how this function will behave. Here's the last example. These functions are undefined on the x-axis where y equals zero, since that would lead to division by zero in the expression. Since x is in the numerator and y is in the denominator, the slopes will be steep for large values of x and small values of y. Well, that happens near the x-axis. And the slopes will be shallow for small values of x and large values of y, and that happens near the y-axis. The slopes are positive in the second and fourth quadrants and negative in the first and third. The paths that match these slopes are half circles, remembering that they are undefined on the x-axis, therefore they can't form full circles. Therefore, I know the behavior of the solutions. They grow, level off, and decay to zero if they start above the x-axis, and vice versa, below the x-axis. They follow circles. This completes the examples and completes this video on qualitative methods. The majority of this course is focused on actually solving on using quantitative methods. But these qualitative methods are immensely valuable, and we will rely on them throughout, even while we are doing the more detailed quantitative solving work.